Thank you so much, Dr. Despande. Can you hear me and can you see my slides? Yes. Wonderful. All right, so I'm very pleased to talk to you today about anti-obesity medications. Um, so let's get going. At least in the United States, the prevalence of obesity in the United States has gone from about 10% in the 60s to today's, uh, you know, over 40% of Americans have a BMI over 30. It's almost half of the population. There doesn't seem to be a, um, a halting of the increase in prevalence. And so we need to do something about it. If you look at the trends, in both overweight and obesity, so overweight is defined as a BMI over 25, you can see that back in the 1960s, the prevalence of overweight was fairly high, uh, and obesity, and more importantly, severe obesity was low. Obesity prevalence was a little bit over 10% um, uh, or so, and severe obesity was very, very rare. And now we see that a prev the prevalence of overweight hasn't changed. It's still about 30% of the population, but obesity now over 40% and severe obesity defined as a BMI over 40 for which bariatric surgery is indicated is almost 10%. So what happened is that our genes don't work that quickly. We certainly know that in the prevalent in in the in the uh, presence of this environment, um, the genes that determine um, storage of body fat and the ability to store fat um, uh, can help exacerbate the obesity. But our genes haven't changed since the '60s, and so we you know, assume that it is the environment that has changed. And what's changed in the environment is uh, the presence of ultra processed foods. That's what's changed in the environment. Why do we want to treat this um, condition? First of all, obesity is a disease. And secondly, it causes other uh, complications that then cause death, and it accounts for 4 million deaths worldwide per year, and it's a, it, it causes heart disease and diabetes. So we need to treat it, and this treatment needs to be immediate, actually. And so what are the, what are the treatments that we have available? Well, you know, we're going to talk about behavior. Uh, what kind of weight loss and maintenance of the weight loss can a multi-component behavioral intervention help produce about two to 5% weight loss? Now, no. if you have a patient who weighs 300 pounds, uh, that's going to be up to 15 pounds. And, you know, these patients need to lose more than that. Intensive prescriptive nutritional interventions, very low calorie diets, and the protein sparing modified fast can help elicit a 5 to 10% weight loss. Drugs, which we're going to talk about, can now elicit up to 20%. We have endoscopic procedures, the uh, endoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, where you suture a piece of the stomach clothed. That can help elicit a 10 to 20% weight loss. And the only treatment that can produce up to a 40% weight loss is indeed bariatric surgery, which will be, be talked about um, in the next uh, talk right after mine. So the treatment intensity goes up, but so does the complications. And we'll talk about those. Now, having said that, very few uh, patients are treated for their obesity in the United States with a drug. There are many reasons for that, but if you compare the medical treatment for obesity versus the medical treatment for diabetes, 
In this country, as I said, 45% of Americans have obesity and about, you know, 14% of Americans have diabetes caused by obesity. Diabetes is caused by obesity. I have two diabetes. How many patients are treated with at least one drug for their, for their diabetes? About 85% right here, okay? And when you think about obesity, only 2% of the population that has obesity are treated with a drug. If you said this about any other condition, hypertension, you know, cardiovascular disease, you would say that we're practicing negligence and malpractice. But because obesity, there are no guidelines saying you must treat obesity, patients who walk into their doctor's office, primary care, they can have a BMI of 40 and above and the doctor doesn't have to address it. That's the problem. So we developed guidelines. I was the first author, the chair of this guideline that was published in 2015 in the Journal of Endocrinology and um, JCEM, the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. And we um, gave guidelines for how to treat obesity and how to uh, not provide uh, patients drugs that cause obesity, that cause weight gain. How, what, what uh, conditions uh, prompts a doctor to give your patient a medication? And these should be per prescriptive, but they're not yet. They're just suggestive. So anybody with a BMI over 30 is a candidate for an anti-obesity agent and over 27 with at least one comorbidity or complication. What are these complications? Reflux, arthritis, back pain, metabolic syndrome, you know, uh, diabetes, heart disease, all of that. How does the FDA approve an anti-obesity drug for use in the United States? The drug must induce a significant placebo adjusted weight loss loss of at least 5% weight loss or at least 35% of patients on the intervention arm should achieve a 5% weight loss which must be at least twice that induced by placebo in addition to those two criteria you must either or the medication should show improvement in blood pressure, lipids, and glycemic control, not the opposite. So, uh, several drugs were approved by the FDA in 2013 and 2014, and then semaglutide, which has gotten quite a bit of attention in the media now, was approved in 2021. It's indicated for weight management in patients with a BMI over 30 or 27 with at least one ailment. It works by mimicking GLP-1, which is a naturally occurring gut hormone. Therefore, it's the first drug for obesity, which is a analog of a naturally occurring gut hormone, which regulates appetite and food intake. So you, you know, patients should see this as an injectable vitamin. All right, because it's a naturally occurring hormone. The dosing is increased gradually to reduce the nausea and vomiting uh, uh, constipation and fatigue that you know you can get if you suddenly try to give semaglutide to a patient at a dose of 1.7 or 2.4, they are going to get very nauseous. Now, what about the efficacy? This has really doubled the weight loss that you have you were able to see with the other drugs so this is why it's such a game changer as it has been called in the media the step trials step one looked at obesity alone and with obesity alone you get a 15 percent body weight change unbelievable step two in diabetes you get a almost 10% uh, weight loss. 
Step three, weight management with intensive behavior. You, you see that the weight loss is enhanced by an intensive behavioral program instead of a normal behavioral program or light. And step four was looking at week the second year with uh, how if you keep the patient on the drug, do you get weight maintenance? And you certainly do, especially compared to the placebo group, which lost the weight, but then got placebo. So they got the first year, they got the semaglutide and the second year they got placebo, they gained weight. Of course, why would you even have to do this with a drug for hypertension? You know already that if you take the patient off, off the drug, the blood pressure is going to come back. Why do you have to do this with obesity? Because people don't realize it's a disease. So we have to show them that it's a disease. All right. Now, here I am comparing the two new drugs, semaglutide and trisepatide, with the other drugs. So the best drug in the past was fentope, combination of fentamine and topiramate. We got almost 10% weight loss. Liraglutide. Um, which is Saxenda, Fentamilone, Naltrexone, Bupropion, or Contraven, Orlistat, or Zenecal. You see the, the increase in weight loss with semaglutide, uh, which is followed here by trizepatide, which was approved as Manjaro for diabetes and soon to be approved for obesity in the next few months, we hope, uh, giving you an 18% weight loss. Now this is placebo subtracted. So you add the placebo weight loss and it's gonna be 22%, which guess what is almost like a sleeve gastrectomy. Here's the, here is the uh, weight loss that was published in the New England Journal with patients with obesity, 15 milligram dose, 21% weight loss, which is incredible. Okay, we're changing the way obesity is treated in this country. All right, now here is a slide showing all of the FDA uh, one and two year studies that were, that were presented to the FDA before these drugs were approved, starting with Orlistat, with the Zendos trial. Here's uh, Fentope, which is Qsimia. The core studies, Contrave, the scale trials for, for Saxenda, um, the GLOW study for the uh, device um, Plenity, and then Semaglutide or Wagovi and Trizepatide or Manjaro. As you can see, this is the categorical weight losses compared to placebo. Most patients on the intervention arm are losing at least 5%. And the biggest percentages are with the latter two agents, which are GLP-1 hormones, which is why we're so excited. Most patients on these newer agents are gonna lose weight. Now here is where we compare the drugs, the anti-obesity agents to the sleeve gastrectomy. Now the sleeve gastrectomy produces a 25% average weight loss at the end of a year. The Ruy gastric bypass will produce 33% weight loss, but that isn't as, as um, utilized as much as now that, now that the, the sleeve gastrectomy has come um, to its heyday because the sleeve gastrectomy is an easier procedure and uh, doesn't doesn't uh, bypass any of the intestine. Patients like that better, even though the Ruy gastric bypass is gonna give you more weight loss. But if you compare the sleeve gastrectomy now to these newer agents, you see that we're not too far off, especially with terzepatide at its highest dose, 50 milligrams, you're basically getting a surgical weight loss with one drug, which is a combination of two gut hormones, GLP-1 and GIP. 
this is why um, this is such a game changer. Now, if you combine surgery with medication, you get even better weight loss. Now this, we haven't done this yet with terzepatide. Uh, we've, we've done a bit of it with semaglutide, but we need longer term studies showing what does semaglutide in combination with the sleeve gastrectomy um, we're probably not going to be able to produce better weight loss, but we're going to be able to produce maintenance of the weight loss that you see with surgery. So here we have a case of a patient who had a weight of 371 pounds, <clears throat> diet and exercise, as you see, can produce a 10% weight loss, but then there's weight regain. Of course, there's weight regain with diet and exercise. It always happens. Um, we're not changing the, the, the body's uh, defense of the weight in this environment. So the patients regain weight. They get placed on medications here, fent uh, metformin plus fentope, lost weight again, regained got the laparoscopic adjustable band, which we don't do anymore because it's just a band that's placed around the stomach, doesn't change any gut hormones. So obviously the patient's gonna lose weight, but they're gonna start to regain. And then the patient was placed back on metformin fentope. And with the combination of the laparoscopic band plus three medications, the total weight loss is 100 pounds. Um, of course, there's going to be weight regain. You, you don't lose sight of these patients. You, you follow them every three months forever, but there's weight loss and maintenance. Now, even though these drugs are effective, as I said before, they're rarely prescribed. Why? Nearly 50% of adults fit criteria for the use of anti-obesity pharmacotherapy. It's a disease. It causes morbidity and mortality, but less than 2% of patients eligible received an anti-obesity medi medication uh, in the last year. Uh, yeah, more patients with higher BMIs, but look at this, 3.4%. That's ridiculous. Why is that? Because people don't realize it's a disease. They still think it's a matter under of, of their willpower. Patients and providers don't understand. And then in the end, if you don't get insurance coverage of these medications, they're expensive. So, okay. Why is obesity a disease? Here is a schematic showing you the arcuate nucleus and the hypothalamus of two sets of neurons. If you activate POMC CART, you get satiety. And look at all the afferents they get. GLP-1, leptin, insulin, ghrelin, PYY. Ghrelin uh, deactivates POMC and activates the other side, which causes hunger. You get these afferents from the gut and from fat tissue, telling the brain, do you have enough fat to live? Fat storage. Um, and it's a very tightly controlled system. If the afferents say, you know, there's not enough fat, the patient, the, the, we're hungry, then you're going to reduce, you're going to re reduce the um, uh, activation of satiety, you're going to get hunger, and you're going to get decrease in total energy expenditure, okay, upstream, until the patient regains the weight. And then the environment is also playing a role here somehow, the brain senses that the environment is full of high calorie food and you still have the genes eons ago that said when you see a deer, you eat the whole thing because you don't know when you're going to see another one. Same genes are effective today. So our genes haven't gotten to 2023 where we have too much food in the environment 
and uh, we're storing a lot of body fat, and that's what's happening. Where do our drugs work? They work in the same area, in that arcuate nucleus to activate the satiety center, but they all, some of them also work in the reward center, i.e. naltrexone bupropion. Naltrexone is an anti-addiction agent, and also uh, semaglutide and liraglutide also have reward pathway. Uh, and what does this do? It makes you not want to go for the chocolate and the reward and the sweets. It makes you instead prefer healthy food. Amazingly so, but that's what it does. GLP-1, our agonism has changed the face of how we treat obesity. It has effects in the brain, as I said, decreasing reward, food intake, palatability of, of sweets. But it also works in the intestine, decreases gastric emptying and gastrointestinal motility. So the food stays in there longer and continues to get to, to elicit satiety. It works in the liver to reduce fat in the liver, in the pancreas, um, and in the muscle. All right, so there are multiple uh, agonisms that GLP-1 enhances that makes it far and away much better than the older agents that just reduce hunger in the brain. Now, I don't have to do this because you understand that obesity is a disease, but long-term ongoing therapy is needed because if you stop the drug, the weight comes back. You can superimpose what happens to diabetes and hypertension if you stop the medications. Your blood pressure goes back up and your blood sugar goes back up. Okay, so once, and we even studied this, here is the findings when you lose weight with semaglutide and then you the second year give the patient placebo the patient gains seven percent back we proved it you have to stay on the drug to keep the weight off if you don't lose 5% of your body weight at three months, what you need to do is to add another medication or switch it out by something that works. Because even though 91% and 86% of patients lost at least 5%, there's still, even with terzepatide, there's still that 9% that are not uh, responsive to that drug, so you need to add something to that. <clears throat> now we're going to switch off and talk about lifestyle. Here is what you can get with lifestyle alone. With a very low calorie diet, you can get a lot of weight loss. But once you stop that very low calorie diet, you're going to gain it back. With intensive behavioral therapy, you're going to get four to six percent with a light lifestyle intervention three to five percent weight loss again this is not enough for most people why do we use vlcds 10 percent weight loss prior to fertility treatment for women to enhance fertility prior to an orthopedic intervention prior to uh being on a being on the list for cardiac transplant you have to have a bmi less than 35 prior to a kidney transplant, prior to any surgery that will have increased risk of complications if the patient doesn't relieve the fat tissue and its effects on the organs. Anti-obesity agents give you three to 17% weight loss. As I already told you, the band up to 23%, but that, that weight is is regained after a while because you're just putting a restriction and not changing gut hormones. Add medications to the band, now we're talking. As I told you about that one patient, 
the gastric sleeve 25 to 35%, the bypass up to 38% and more. Um, but diet, exercise, and behavior is important for all of the modalities. Why? Because the surgery and the drugs help you stay on diet and exercise. That's what it does. It helps you stay on the program. It's a uh, me, drugs and surgery are adjuncts to lifestyle intervention. Alone, you're going to get improved metabolic control with lifestyle and quality of life. What are the components of lifestyle, nutrition, act, physical activity, and healthy behavioral habits, limiting alcohol, getting enough sleep, because if you don't get enough sleep, your hunger hormones are revved up, and stress reduction as well. The components are a reduced calorie meal plan, more physical activity, and behavioral intervention. Okay. Um, all right. How do you intensify lifestyle? In the doctor's office, you're going to get some advice. You can use the internet or self-help books to adjunct to that. Advice from a dietitian. A dietitian has about an hour to spend on recipes and how to eat healthy, whereas a doctor doesn't have all that time. You can also use structured programs. Weight Watchers is a great plan to use or any other structured program. Nutrisystem, Jenny Craig, um, and some of the internet programs. Multidisciplinary structured programs in-house like we have at the Brigham are also helpful and physician driven individualized structured programs, which we also have where patients come in every few months to uh, see how the medications are doing and uh, behavioral programs. We have weekly programs run by our dietitians. The guidelines that we published in 2013 are still uh, helpful. They are being updated as we speak. But what will not change is using the BMI to identify risk greater than 25, overweight, greater than 30, obesity. Using the waist circumference to enhance uh, education on the risk. So over 35 inches or over 40 inches in a male um, is indicative of a lot of fat around the belly, which it get, puts you at higher risk for diabetes and heart disease. Counseling patients that a three to 5%, even as little weight loss as that will reduce risk factors and risk of diabetes. Any kind of a reduced calorie program is, 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 is beneficial for weight loss. There's no ideal diet. So the typical American diet gives you an average of 2,200 calories a day. You're not going to lose weight with that. Balanced nutrient, moderate calories, calorie approaches. The DASH diet, which is 25% fat, or my pyramid, or commercial plans are all great for weight loss. Now, is there a difference with a low fat versus a low carb diet? No. Foster and colleagues proved this way back in 2010, where they gave patients either a low fat or a low carb diet. And you can see here, there's no difference in weight loss or weight regain um, on these diets. You can lose weight with any, with the DASH diet, with the Mediterranean diet, and with the Atkins diet as long as you reduce the calories taken in. All right, now the Diabetes Prevention Program and Look Ahead showed that a weight loss of 7% by reducing food portions and replacing energy dense foods with lower energy density can reduce weight, BMI, reduce visceral body fat, health complications, 
improve your sleep and increase your life expectancy. How about physical activity? All right, what do you need to do? 150 to 300 min minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity each week or 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous aerobic activity each week will help, it will help maintain a weight loss. Muscle strengthening exercises, if you increase your muscle mass, you will increase your resting metabolic rate and be able to maintain the weight loss. For older adults, it's even more important to do resistance exercise because you're gonna develop sarcopenia, which is a loss of muscle mass. If you lose your muscle mass, you can't eat a lot. That's for sure. High intensity is the only kind of physical activity that can help you lose weight without a low calorie diet. Has to be high intensity, all right? And this has been shown that, you know, if you, if you uh, expend 500 calories per session, you can lose weight. But usually people who do this kind of exercise eat more because they get hungry. And that's why if you do physical activity alone, you're not necessarily gonna lose weight. But in addition to watching your calories, you can, all right? Exercise on weight loss itself, um, you know, you can do that if you, um, if you reduce your calories also, but exercise alone can improve your risk of diabetes, even without weight loss, improve your bone mineral density and your heart rate and your blood pressure. So even just exercise alone is gonna help even if you don't get the weight loss, remember that. Lifestyle intervention support can be individual with your dietitian, has, has to be repeated regularly. Group support can be helpful and also cost effective. What are the components of success? Reduce calorie meal plans, exercise, and either face-to-face -face group sessions or remote technologies through the internet. So what's your weight loss gonna be at one year in alone and in combination with drugs? As you can see, you're gonna be able to lose about five to 7% with high intensity lifestyle interventions alone. This was proven by Look Ahead and DPP. These were not cost effective. A lot of coaching. And so, um, but with, the, with medication plus, you can get um, most patients losing at least 5%. Adherence, not the diet itself, predicts success. So doesn't matter what diet you put the patient on, as long as it's a healthy diet, they're gonna lose weight. I just wanna summarize here. Uh, at least in the United States, 42% of adults have obesity with, defined as a BMI over 30. There are now several effective FDA approved anti-obesity medications. Semaglutide is the newest, producing up to 20% weight loss. Terzepatide will give you more than that, and it will uh, be fast-tracked for obesity treatment. You can add medications to post-op bariatric surgery weight regain and prevent that weight regain. We still have an underutilization of obesity medications because of insurance coverage. Lifestyle can achieve, um, can be an adjunct to medications and surgery uh, for success of most patients. So I want to thank you very much. And I'll be back uh, after our speaker for bariatric surgery for more questions. Thanks so much.